acceleration of the African continent of free trade area implementation is an avenue for leaders or African president to evaluate the successes of, of the trade agreement and of course uh, uh, brainstorm or chat ways to tackle the challenges facing the practical implementation or the uh, uh, full operationalization of the uh, African continent of free trade area, which is Africa's uh, economic game changer if all its advantages are fully exploited. According to reports, uh, AFTAS uh, has the potential to boost intra-Africa trade by 60% uh, come the year 2034 uh, by uh, eliminating almost all tariffs. It, uh, equally, uh, has the potential or the capacity to open an economic block of 1.3 billion people with a combined gross domestic product of $3.4 trillion. It is an answer to some of the problems faced by Africa, like infrastructure shortcomings, supply chain, financial dependence, trade laws and regulations, cross-border initiatives, investment-friendly policies, and capital flow. The single and free trade zone is working towards strengthening Africa's global positioning in trade, considering that it's the world's top producer of numerous critical mineral commodities. Aside the African continent of free trade area, African presidents are expected also to uh, brainstorm on the phenomenon of coups that uh, characterize the West African region in uh, uh, recent years. Uh, the equally going to discuss uh, upcoming elections, the political squabbles uh, between uh, uh, parties in Libya, and of course, uh, looking at the Ukraine crisis and uh, the consequences faced uh, by Africa, among the others. What, therefore, are the concrete steps uh, to be taken uh, to ensure, or uh, after uh, this uh, session or this sitting of the African uh, head of state, to ensure that they change narratives in all spheres across the African continent? What are the concrete steps to be taken to ensure uh, that after the status state of narration of uh, head of state and government who are currently meeting in uh, the AU headquarters uh, at this Abeba in Ethiopia, uh, what are the steps that can go ahead to change the narratives across all spheres in Africa? And uh, you're welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Pan-African debate on the Pan-African television. Today, we want to analyze uh, the ongoing uh, to a third to see the ordinary session uh, summit of, of the uh, African head of state and government holding in Ethiopia. And of course, uh, uh, the central theme is focus on trade. And today and all, over the months or years, we've been talking about African economic integration. And we have heard in the preamble the potential or the potentiality of the African continent of free trade area to boost intra Africa trade and, of course, solve some of the economic economic problems uh, faced by the continent Africa, but then uh, over the years, with the recent happenings uh, uh, at the, both the international and local level, we saw that the full implementation of this uh, historic uh, free trade was actually uh, hanging on the balance as uh, leaders of various governments were concerned on s with solving internal problems. But then, today, seeing that the uh, leaders have actually reinitiated uh, talks towards seeing the full operationalization or implementation of the continent of free trade area, we of course are optimistic that uh, things will turn around after this uh, uh, very important uh, session. Uh, this is a program that is informative and it is interactive as well. I implore all of you to be part of this program as uh, together with this uh, panel of experts, we continue to uh, dissect uh, the uh, uh, issues of the African continent, uh, focusing uh, on the African continent free trade area, looking at the successes and of course the challenges and how these challenges can uh, be resolved uh, to bring of course uh, uh, the uh, economic integration 
of the continent Africa. Thank you, uh, thank you once more for joining us. I will uh, go straight away uh, to uncovering the panel uh, of today, uh, the, the panel that will give insight to this very important topic. And I'm glad to introduce to you Pofong Chavans. He is the CEO of Legacy Holdings, an entrepreneur, investor as well. Thank you for joining with us there, uh, Pofong Chavans, on the Pan-African debate. Thank you very much, Clarice. Uh, good afternoon, uh, televiewers of uh, Africa Media. It's once more a pleasure joining us this afternoon as we accompany African leaders in Addis Ababa to look into the future of the African continental free trade area and how it stands to benefit the business class and the uh, uh, human resource class of Africa as it, it, it stands to const contribute uh, positively towards the development of the African continent. So in the next two hours we'll be deliberating, seeing what the leaders can do and what we as Africans too can do to advance this great gesture that has been in the pipeline over the times and has faced his own hiccups but now we hope that at this time we'll be able to actually resolve it in a way that it will benefit us as a people. Indeed, it is imperative uh, that other stakeholders also brainstorm and see how they can contribute their own quarter to see that uh, the uh, uh, African continent of free trade area uh, goes to its full implementation and of course the continent will benefit uh, from uh, the uh, advantages. Thank you again, uh, uh, Profound Jevons. Uh, joining via Zoom, I'll be going uh, to Canada to meet uh, Mr. Elijah Inoako. He's joining us as a researcher with Lixo University on uh, African development. It's a pleasure having you this day uh, on the Pan-African debate, Mr. Enoko. Thanks for having me, Clarice. Uh, hopefully we can have a, a two hours of fruitful discussion while African leaders are having a, a discussion in Addis Ababa. We are also having our own discussion over the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope lots of our viewers from Uganda, Nigeria, um, the English speaking world and also the French speaking world can join us in this discussion, which is very, very crucial for Africa because this has been long overdue. Long overdue. The African Free Trade Agreement and the zone and the area and everything that's supposed to go into that, this has been long overdue. So, this is going to be a fruitful discussion, I hope. Indeed, uh, looking forward to having a fruitful uh, discussion. Uh, like you've underlined, it is a crucial uh, project for the African continent. The African continent of free trade area is a game changer that is going to change the economic trajectory of uh, the uh, uh, Africa of Africa. If actually we fully exploit all the advantages that it brings joining us again is a, a lady here uh, she is a tenure tire and a trade and uh, uh, investment uh, expert she's joining us this day on the pan-african debates to share on view on this very important topic hello to you uh, mrs tire it's a pleasure having you for the first time on the pan-african television you're most welcome Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and it's always very nice to exchange with colleagues on the key issues facing African development, such as free trade or the African continent of free trade area. Thank you for having me. And I thank you for the great uh, sacrifices you've made to be with us uh, this day. And uh, without wasting time, I'll go straight away uh, to, to get the, the viewpoint. We're going now straight away to Addis Ababa to meet uh, Big Ben Lewis, who is presently uh, part of the uh, African Union Summit, uh, as he tells us about the atmosphere uh, there in Addis Ababa as leaders sit to uh, brainstorm on issues concerning Africa. Uh, exactly, Clarice. The wish of every African and uh, different African heads of states is to uh, uh, see that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which was adopted in 2019 and uh, began uh, in implementing in 2021, uh, the wish of every African is that this uh, agreement is uh, effective uh, so that it can permit the free movement of people and goods. But of course, we know, like I had mentioned, security is one of the hindrances of uh, the 
the, the implementation of this agreement. Uh, many believe that uh, the African continental free trade area has been making baby steps, but we know that insecurity remains one of the biggest threats uh, to uh, the hindering the effective implementation of the African continental free trade area. That's why uh, heads of state and government uh, will be fine-tuning ways and putting together efforts to uh, ensure that this agreement is uh, fully implemented and goes effective. That's why uh, security situations around the continent will be looked into. Although we know that the African Union failed in achieving its objective 2020, which was to silence the guns in the continent, but we know that the guns still continue smoking. But the African Union will be taking equally credits uh, for ending uh, the uh, war in Ethiopia. Of course, thanks to the African Union's mediation, the crisis in Ethiopia uh, has it's now having a solution, a way out. We are hoping that uh, some of these discussions, which we know equally, the role that the youths have to play in the effective implementation of the African Union uh, con African Continental Free Trade Agreement, we equally understand that there are several aspects that has to do with uh, uh, the implementation of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. We, we are expecting all of those discussions uh, to be highlighted, and uh, the uh, African Union Agenda 2063 will equally be looked into. That's, of course, uh, the highlights for now, Clarice, we just want to tell you that more will be coming up as we'll be expecting to, to, to bring to you more of um, what is happening here in Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, as African uh, heads of state and governments are meeting here today. Ben Lewis, and of course, he was uh, elaborating on the, the question of uh, if there is hope uh, that after this uh, uh, session we are going to see practical changes given that uh, the event that unfolded across Africa and, of course, across the global world actually uh, uh, challenged uh, the practicality of the uh, uh, African continent. Uh, African continent of free trade area. We stay with you, Big Ben uh, Luis. I'll still continue to tell us about the atmosphere there in Addis Ababa. Yes, uh, hello, Clarice, and your panelists of the panel. Big Ben Luis? headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. We're expecting 54 heads of state and governments to gather here today to discuss issues affecting uh, the continent. Most importantly, the theme of the 2023 African Union Summit, which focuses on ameliorating the implementation of Congo. Uh, we had the president of Tanzania, Kenya, as well as Rwanda, among others, were in discussions yesterday to evaluate and find ways to end the uh, insecurity situation in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. We understand the insecurity situation in Libya, as well as other areas. We're equally expecting that uh, uh, the situation in Cameroon will equally feature on the African Union's agenda. We understand it's one of the crises which is highly being neglected. We had uh, equally other side meetings uh, with regards to uh, today's uh, event. Of course, the atmosphere, like you earlier uh, asked, is quite friendly and very busy, of course. Ben Luisa for informing us, uh, letting us know how things are being uh, 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 unfolding there in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, coming back uh, to the studio, uh, and of course, telling those of you just tuning in uh, that this is the Pan African uh, debate uh, on African media. Uh, what are the states? Uh, do, do we expect uh, a great change after this meeting that uh, uh, head of state are actually holding uh, in uh, Addis Ababa? focusing on the historic uh, free trade area. I will start off with you, uh, uh, Mrs. Tayo. We're looking at uh, the uh, third seat ordinary session of uh, African head of state and government, and we are focusing this on the uh, historic free trade area. Holistically, uh, what can you say, especially uh, as the team this time around talk about trade? And of course, you know, uh, it has been uh, the plight to see uh, that there is economic integration across Africa. Well, as you said, the AFCFTA was launched in 2021, January 2021, actually, 
And since then, we've not been able to actually start trading under the AFCFD. So there's an interim agreement or arrangement called the GTI, the Guided Trade Initiative. But the fact remains that the AFCFT itself is not fully enforced because um, the negotiations are still ongoing. So if you know a little bit about the negotiations, you have the phase one negotiations and the phase two negotiations. And there's some key things still under the phase one negotiations for trading goods that they're still trying to push forward. So my hope is that this union or this gathering of heads of states, you know, can provide some of the political motivation, political support to push negotiations through <laughs> because the negotiations are being carried out by the technical guys, the, the trade ministers from different countries, but really need that political push so that we can have the AFCFT agreement, at least the phase one, and we can start trading properly under the AFCFT. So I am optimistic. I, I guess I am glad that the AFCFT EU is focusing on this this year. I think that the reason why they're focusing on this this year is because they want to move the negotiations forward. They want it to be top of the agenda for the political leaders. They want everyone or all hands to be on board or on deck, you know, to make sure that we can start moving towards this goal of a single African market, increase in traffic and trade, and then by extension, um, prosperity for Africans. And just to even summarize again what the AFCFTA is, it's a plan to create a single African market so that Africans can trade with each other, but not trade goods produced by other people, trade goods produced by Africans within Africa so that together we can grow our incomes, we can increase our prosperity, we can grow our livelihoods, and we can just become better off than we found ourselves um, relative to the rest of the world lined already, uh, the uh, African continent of free trade area is uh, a game changer for the continent. Uh, being uh, a, a trade and investment expert, uh, we equally uh, uh, know that the uh, uh, African continental free trade area can go a long way to increase uh, f uh, foreign direct investment uh, uh, across Africa or in Africa. In your own perspective, what do you think, what are those steps that uh, stakeholders or those at the fore can actually uh, put in place to ensure uh, that the fast track this uh, uh, investment or foreign direct investment across Africa with the uh, African continental free trade area of course so when you talk to foreign investors and you ask them why they're not investing in africa for those that are not here yet um they say maybe two major things they talk about the size of the market you know that the market size is not enough to justify the capital investment that you'll have to make in order to start producing things here and then they talk about the regulatory environment the fact that it's very disparate you have for example in west africa just moving from nigeria to benin to togo you're going to be facing very different regulatory environments and it can be very difficult for you to navigate as an investor so the afcft is trying to address this um to some extent there is the investment protocol, which I learned has been concluded. They're finalizing the paperwork. And what it's going to do is to try to sort of clean up the regulatory environment to make it easier for investments within the single market. But the investment protocol is targeted more at local direct investment because it's not only about foreign investment. You know, now that we have a single market, you have African investors within Africa investing in other African countries. This has been happening for a while. You have South African investment in Nigeria, you have investments from Mauritius in Madagascar, you have a lot of intra-African investment. So we're trying to attract both local and foreign direct investment into, into the continent. So what, to your question again, improving the regulatory environment, um, the business environment as well. I come from a country that is very complicated when it comes to FDI, because for example, if you're an investor, you can't get your dollars out of um, Nigeria at the moment. It's very difficult. So things like currency management, monetary policy that affect investors. Um, also, we need the issue of transportation because now with the single markets, the idea is that if you want to start producing cars, you can go to Kenya and set up production and then export to the rest of Africa. But that is not really possible if it costs too much for you to move your cars from Kenya to the rest of Africa. The single market will only make sense if it's easy enough to access one African country from another through transport. So we have to improve the transport networks um, as well to just make sure that the case is, is, is more solidified for foreign direct investment. But I think finally, we need to get more proactive in trying to attract these investors. The AFCFT is trying to create some regional value chains. And what just this means is that if you're trying to produce cars, you don't have to do everything from step A to step Z in one country. Maybe the brake parts can be produced in Uganda, 
maybe the windshield can be produced in South Africa, maybe the gearbox can be produced in Morocco, and then you have these different value chains and they come together to produce the car. But then in order for that to happen, you need to be very proactive about attracting investments for the different parts of the value chain. So if it's for the, the, the brake parts, and you know the investors that are more likely to um, have some competition, competitive ability and even capacity in setting up those kinds of investments to sell them. You know, within the African value chains, Morocco is a country that makes sense for this. So we think that you should go invest in Morocco and then we can connect you to South Africa, to Uganda, to Kenya, so that by the time everyone comes together, we have enough capacity to, to develop and design on um, cars. So yes, we need to be more proactive about attracting that investment, but also doing the work, you know. Investors are not charity organizations. They want things that are going to make sense for them, for their bottom lines. And as we're trying to move from aid to trade and investment, we need to make sure that we present projects that are very bankable, projects that make sense for the investors, but also very importantly for ourselves. Uh, Mrs. Tayo, you, you quite mentioned about Nigeria. And uh, uh, of course, uh, one uh, last question for you again. Uh, we know that when we look at countries that are already trading under the African continent or free trade area, we have countries like Cameroon, we have Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda, Tunisia, among others. But then, when, you know that when they talk economic uh, uh, buoyancy in Africa, they mention countries like Nigeria, South Africa. So what can explain uh, the, 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 the fact that countries uh, that are seen as uh, the, the great economic hubs across Africa are reluctant to push through with this trade under the historic free trade area. Is, is this not an impediment even for other uh, smaller economies across uh, the African continent? Yeah, so it's true that um, Nigeria, as one example, was a bit reluctant, somewhere in the middle of, you know, negotiating the agreement. At the beginning, very supportive, and then when it was time to, to sign, um, they were a bit reluctant. And the main reason was because as Nigeria, um, our, main, our main export really is commodities, so we mostly export crude oil. We haven't really developed um, sufficiently our manufacturing capacity for other kinds of goods. So what it meant was that Nigeria, as the largest country by population and economy to some extent in Africa, will be entering the AFCFTA mostly as a consumer market. So it wasn't really about Nigeria sending their goods out of Nigeria to other places, but Nigeria receiving goods from other countries in Africa, which I personally do not have a problem with because perhaps that can inspire um, Nigerian producers to better take advantage of the EFCFT by beginning production. So that's the, the, the worry. And it's not just Nigeria. A lot of countries have the same worry. Um, African countries can be very protectionist in their approach to trade sometimes. If you even listen to the rhetoric around the AFCFT, very few people are talking about importing from Africa. Everyone wants to export to Africa. So everyone wants to export to grow their incomes, but then people don't want to open their borders to goods coming from other countries. And it's a problem that I think the AFCFT itself is trying to manage because, for example, when it comes to opening up your border, there is a phased approach. So the LDCs, the less developed countries, have more time to remove the tariffs um, so that they can adjust better to the AFCFT. There's even a group of six, I think, some even less developed countries that have negotiated a lot more time again for them for them to open their borders. But what I would say is that, you know, um, when it comes to Africa, we, we can't go about things the way we've been going about them in the past. So protectionist policies have not helped us so far. It has not helped Nigeria, causing its borders to its neighbors, hurt its economy rather than help its economy. That's one of the reasons why we have such high inflation um, today. So it's better for us to think about things more in a regional approach. How can we together um, grow trade? How can we together grow production? How can we leverage our strengths and weaknesses to make sure that we are going about global development or African development as a unit rather than as individual countries because um we're struggling we, we struggle when it comes to that. So protectionist policies on one side, um general fear of opening your, your borders to goods, but then my own solution is the more Ubuntu approach. You know, we have Ubuntu as a philosophy in Africa where it says we should do things together rather than as individuals. Much, uh, uh, Tenula Tayo for your contribution, your insight on uh, today's uh, topic, uh, of course, which focuses on uh, the uh, uh, continental free trade area and how we can, uh, of course, leverage uh, its uh, advantages to spur development across Africa. Uh, let me come back to you, uh, uh, Pufong Javrans. Today we are looking at uh, the uh, uh, 36 ordinary session uh, of the African Head of State and Government ongoing 
China, in Ethiopia, in the where the AU's uh, headquarter is. So, what is your perspective? And of course, what came to mind when you saw that uh, this year's team actually talked about trade? Absolutely, as a young African man in business, when we hear about uh, the free trade area, the first thing we think about is how beneficial it will be to a common person. And uh, when we go through the preamble, we are trying to understand exactly what those who constituted or drafted the preamble had in mind and wh what they were looking at the future. They were looking at, as uh, the other panelists did state, more, uh, the, the biggest problem that the African continental free trade agreement has faced now is the fear of some countries is being dumping grounds or maybe consumers and uh, so on which has actually posed as a big threat to the African uh, continental free trade area agreement but now I think that uh, when I got that information or when I got such a topic futuring as one of the top things that uh, are going to be discussing now this Ababa the first thing I had in mind was that actually if we want to see it come to fruition if we want to see it come into <coughs> implementation then we have to also understand that there is enough or so much education that needs to take place before it can come into fruition. We have to educate people, we have to clear their mind, their fears, and then maybe help them understand that before this uh, agreement was drafted or the preamble was drafted, there were specific objectives, and in the realization of the object objectives, no country is going to be undermined, but rather if the objectives of the AFCTFA is actually realized, it is going to go a long way to boost the economy of Africa, to boost the lives of close to 1.3 billion people living in the African continent, and also to create jobs. And the first thing too that we have to make the African continent understand is that when we talk about the African continental free trade area, we are not only talking about the, the exchange or the exports or imports of goods and services, there is also a possibility of capital development, uh, human capital development, expo uh, uh, exportation and importation, which will go a long way to transform the economy of different countries. Many countries are only scared that maybe another country will produce, or maybe producing nation will produce and dump in their country. They don't want to look at it from the part that there can be a possibility of them importing human capital from other nations that are already producing to actually do the production in their own co uh, countries, which will go a long way to create a vast value chain across the African continent and making the African continent actually being a production hub. So now what African leaders, or what I think African leaders should be looking at is the possibility of decentralizing uh, human capital resource before we even go to that level of uh, the imports and exports of goods and services. We know that one of the things that uh, were, were stated in the preamble was the, uh, the, the possibility to create a continental um, custom block. Of course, if such a continental block is being created, it comes to harmonize, thing, uh, harmonize uh, custom duties, tariffs, importation, the price of importation, and so on, which will create that level terrain or a level through which business can be done within the African continent. So we should not only be scared that there will be uh, consuming nations or uh, some nations will be the act as dumping grounds. We should see how we can leverage on the opportunities other nations are providing to advance our own economies to bolster the lives of our citizens because everything as far as trading is concerned in the African continent would definitely be a win-win to all of us depending on what our leaders seated on the table things they can use to the advantage of our, our people. In data, using things to the advantage of uh, our people to uh, actually uh, add that uh, Africa is usually seen uh, as a young continent. Why? Because uh, above the 70.
population is actually youth and of course vibrant and how can we harness this human capital to actually exploit or leverage on the opportunities uh, that uh, the uh, African continent our free trade area uh, presents to us and of course coming to you Mr. Elijah Enoko today we are looking at the African Union Summit holding in Addis Ababa Ethiopia and we are focusing on the issue that tops the agenda the African continent of free trade area we know that for years Africa has been talking about integration Africa has been talking about trading with itself but then uh, that was actually very subtle but with the coming uh, of the uh, free trade area in 2021 its full implementation there was actually a great euphoria across Africa as people who actually knew the importance of this uh, uh, trade agreement. So in your perspective, let's take 2021 till date. What can you say uh, has been uh, the milestone so far, uh, as far as uh, the uh, continental free trade area is concerned? And of course, what leaders, as they're sitting now in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, what they can practically talk to ensure that the uh, do, things do not end theoretically, but after this session, we see uh, a practicality in the sphere of implementing, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the results of the uh, uh, summit regarding the uh, African continent of free trade area. Thanks for giving me the microphone. Um, I want to say I'm very optimistic, but I'm very pessimistic at the same time. And I'll explain to you what I mean. I'm very optimistic, but I'm very pessimistic. Let's go with some numbers. These are numbers that everybody can verify. African intracontinental trade stands today as we speak at 16 to 17%. That's to say African countries trading among themselves stands at 16% volume of trade. African countries trading with North America, that's Canada and the United States and Mexico, stands at 50% volume of trade. African countries trading with European countries stand at colossal 70% volume of trade. Why is that? Relics of colonialism. Why has it taken the African Union this long to put even the regulatory framework that my colleague, Madame Tayo, was talking from Nigeria? Why has it taken them this long to put a simple, I would call it simple regulatory, why? because it is very easy for the African countries to harmonize the regulatory framework when it comes to trade than harmonizing it with the rest of the world. Whether you're talking about Europe, you're talking about North America, you're talking about China. Number two, I want to tell you that the, uh, the uh, continental African free trade zone or area is not just an economic tool. I want you to go beyond that is going to be a political tool by itself because every country that will be accepted into that free zone needs to be required to put its house in order. So you are not going to import wool from the eastern part of Democratic Republic of Congo into Nigeria. Number three, a lot of countries are looking at this. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about a $3.4 trillion GDP in the African economy. So we're talking about the biggest free trade zone in the world. And when you are talking about this, it means that the rest of the other countries are going to be excluded from this agreement and they will trade with those countries on a different terms, not on the African free trade zone. So there is threat. They feel threat, threatened at the same time. Number four, the African free trade area is going to push the African countries to come up with a single money. money. Monetary policy needs to be discussed because when you're trading in euro, you are trading in rubies, or you are trading in CFA, you are trading in this, that is disjointed monetary policy and the gains of this Afri Africa uh, free trade zone will not be fully beneficial to the African community. So number five, it is also going to make sure that the countries that are signing, remember we are talking about 55 countries, 
the biggest in the whole world. There is no trade zone that has this number of uh, uh, countries. 55 countries coming to an argument to have a single free trade zone. It is colossal. So they are being threatened out from elsewhere. I'm going to tell you the truth. There's political maneuvering that is happening at the same time. Relics of colonialism happen at the same time. People that are going to, you know, my colleague from Nigeria gave you a little hint of that. When you talk about the value added chain, for example, if a car is produced in China and those parts are brought together and they're being, you know, put together, that car is being assembled in Cameroon, in Nigeria, you are going to realize that only about 5% is going to be beneficial to the economies of Nigeria or Cameroon, whichever did assembly. But if that assembly, if the, those parts were manufactured in Nigeria or Tanzania or what part of Africa, and then is being you know, assembled in the other part of Africa, you're going to realize close to 95% value in the production of that car. So what is happening here is that there is a lot of political maneuvering that's happening at the background. Now, the IMF has taken note of this. The IMF came out with a document documenting the advantage of African free trade zone. When the IMF came out with that report, the IMF gave some guidelines, some guidelines to the African Union on what they should do or some of the advantage and so on. But if you look at that document, I always look at the fine print. It's not just in the preamble or whatever I say. Look at the fine print. You're going to realize that the African free, free trade zone needs to come out with an African development bank that is going to back up this free trade zone because if they continue to realize or to depend on the IMF, the Britain Wood Institution, or the World Bank, the profits from this free trade zone will still not be handled by the African free trade zone. I have always said this for Africans to take note that the IMF is going to give loan to every country in the world. Every country in the world will take loan. But the African countries are acquiring loan at 10% rate, while the Western world is acquiring loan at 0.5% rate. Who benefits? And at the same time, African countries will spend all their time paying loans on this, I mean, are paying, uh, servicing the debt. When you're servicing the debt, you're not actually paying the capital on that loan. You're only paying the interest on that loan. Who benefits? It is not the African countries. It's not that free trade zone. So it is going to encompass a lot. That's what I said. I am optimistic. I'm also pessimistic. Are they going to go this far? Because simply creating a free trade zone, uh, Clarice, and all the other viewers in the world, is a good thing. But if you do not put together the infrastructure and the institutions that are going to guarantee that the proceeds from that free trade zone remains within the African countries, you are actually going to create a free trade zone for the other countries to benefit because they are still going to use it, manipulate it, and acquire the benefits of that free trade zone to themselves. So again, it is a good uh, path to take. It's on a good footing. I am hoping that they will go further, further than simply creating this free zone and create these institutions that I've mentioned. An African Development Bank an African Central Bank, not just a development bank, an African Central Bank that is going to dictate African monetary policy that is going to culminate in an African currency, African currency, not the French CFA, not Euro, not anything, African currency. I'm telling you the truth because if you go into the economics of what a monetary policy, the benefit of it, of Africa having their own money, trading in their own money, if the Europeans are coming to trade with us, they trade in our own currency. If the Americans are coming to trade with us, they trade in our own currency. The benefits of that is colossal to the African economy. So again, I am optimistic, but I'm not there yet.
uh, Enoko, it is imperative to be optimistic. You just highlighted many areas uh, which we were going uh, uh, to look at it critically uh, as we continue to uh, uh, unfold today uh, on the Pan African uh, uh, debate, uh, Mr. Perform Gerard. Uh, I just want to remind our viewers that this is Views on the Continent on the Pan African Television, and we are looking at the AU Summit uh, uh, focusing on the African continent, our free trade area. The successes its potentials to unlock so many things across africa and of course the challenges and how these challenges can be tackled gradually until africa reaches the summit uh, mr elijah mentioned the aspect of uh, uh, um, africa financial uh, independence uh, of course i was co uh, going to come to that uh, uh, mr perform jovens so in your own perspective and of course as uh, a businessman uh, in uh, in africa what do you think because we are very uh, sure uh, that the african free trade area is uh, a, a milestone towards seeing uh, uh, Africa have, uh, has its own currency. So in your own perspective, what is that thing uh, that is impeding Africa from getting towards that financial independence? And of course, how can we go about uh, putting, uh, so resolving uh, this impediment? Absolutely. When we talk about Africa gaining financial independence, it's really quite a broad topic. Uh, coupled with the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, countries in Africa that are still struggling to gain full independence. Uh, you know, I, I always prefer to use the word uh, struggling to gain full independence than neocolonialism because uh, most of uh, us in Africa uh, did not actually understand that independence was a process. We just thought that it was going to be a type of uh, a document we were going to sign, then we will live with it forever. So many countries still struggling to gain it. And uh, those uh, countries that actually has been completely liberated by their former colonial masters, and they have uh, financial autonomy, they have a central bank, and they develop their own monetary policy, they actually do not value the natural resources they have, which is actually the bedrock of the African continent. So if Africa wants to actually gain that financial independence, the first thing we have to understand and we have to acknowledge and we have to treat it as our jewel is our natural resources. When we can value it, our national resources and put them at an international scale and we are going to the level of financial autonomy or financial financial independence, we know that the value of our current will be backed by our natural resources and we will not need an expert from somewhere to come and tell us how our currency is supposed to be or maybe the value or to determine the value of our currency in the international market or on exchange platforms. But now, in Africa, you have a good number of countries in Africa that still depends on their colonial masters as far as the, uh, their, their currency value is, uh, is rated. And uh, most of the African currencies we are pegged to the, uh, when it comes to uh, international exchange, they link them directly to the dollar. So the value of the dollar indirectly determines what happens to our currency which is not supposed to be the fact which is not supposed to be the scenario absolutely because we have resources we have a lot of mineral resources I always say that the, the, the Africa is like a mother that has a lot of resources in our womb that if we were to base our development uh, on the resources we can go as far as conquering the world just with what we have buried under Africa so if we want to gain that type of financial autonomy, that type of financial uh, independence, we should look more at our natural resources, we should look more at what we have as a people independent of what foreign bodies have to do with it because those resources are actually here in Africa they are not in another continent we are the ones seated on them and we are the ones that have the powers the intelligence to actually go through them so we have to control our level of intelligence and see how we are managing it that it can 
lead us to, to gain a type of financial power, a financial autonomy that will help us come to the discussion table and then we know that this is what we are bringing on table. Unfortunately for Mother Africa, that is what the West have understood. That this is what, that is the strength of Africa and for them to ensure that we remain a weak continent, they must always infiltrate us through our leaders. They must always want to give our leaders what they think or maybe please give a type of uh, uh, a glass wall look to our leaders to think that beyond the glass there is something better and then they go ahead thinking that oh the status quo is the best for us or maybe we can only support by the status quo, which of course have never been the case. So now as we are looking at this, as Mr. Elijah rightly said, there is, a, uh, there is a need for us to see that the right institutions are put in place to bolster or to buffer the activities of the African continental trade uh, area. Nevertheless, we have an African Development Bank, but at times when you look at the African Development Banks, who are those that actually own shares in the African Development Bank? You see that African countries are on there as uh, clients i call uh, most of the african continents apart from nigeria are clients to the african development bank they are not actually shareholders to the bank so they cannot very very prob problematic they cannot even take decisions on the uh, uh, african development bank regarding africa so th it's a bank that uh, it's like a group of business people start some decided that okay let's pick one country or a few countries from africa that can buy shares in this bank then we, we bring them then we use the other 50 four or 53 countries as our clients and we make our money and that has been the modus operandi of the west and they as we are trying to battle with the african continental free trade area they are also looking at the possibilities of making sure it becomes beneficial to them because they really don't want to believe that such a market with a with a, with a huge gdp will, will, will tend to, to 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 benefit a continent that have been looking at it to be maybe a wasted resources or a, a, a wasted resource sorry or a continent occupied by children of a lesser god they are also thinking of what they can do benefit from so in as much as our leaders go ahead to discuss or to see how it can be instituted we should also be there blowing the trumpet as we always do for them to see the reasons to make it more beneficial to us if not we will only be there as actors but the beneficiaries as mr elijah said will never be us that occupy the african continent we will just be clients uh, indeed, Africa has to, to benefit uh, from the opportunities of the continental free trade area. I think it's time for us to give uh, uh, viewers uh, the opportunity to contribute their own quarter, to give their own opinion on uh, this very important uh, uh, topic. We are going right away to Benin City uh, to meet uh, Mr. City joining us this day. Hello to you, sir, and thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the, the Pan-African debate. So hello, hello, madam. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon to yes, you, sir. Uh, yes, Mr. City from Benin. You're welcome. First of all, first of all, I would like to greet all your Pan African that we have here in the best and very good television, madam. I'm very disappointed. Very, very disappointed. See. In Ukraine today, there is a war between Russia and Europeans and Americans. A good opportunity to take an historical decision for Africa continent because they are in war. And this war will certainly be lost by a lot of uh, by, by Europeans. See the stupidness and nonsense that they are taking as a decision. Tell me exactly, how can we create zone tops? How can we create free terms up, uh, zone tops without currency? How? It's not possible. It means that, once again, our president has spent all, spent all our money to fly, to joke, and to make to dramatize this is a this is a piece of our country for our country how can we create a free zone without currency without without a currency 
our own currency and and as how can we also create a free zone trap without goods see we cultivate i mean we grow cotton iron we have the same goods how what are we going to exchange madam what what are we going to exchange but we are talking about free zone tap it's not when we, when we talk about free zone tap is not to 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 buy some goods from europe or america and come to sell it to our fair and to africa an african country buy a goods in europe or america and sell it to his fellows is not creating free zone trap. It means that when we want to talk about uh, free zone trap, it means that we have our own goods that we can exchange, that we can exchange among African countries so that to make profit and import it freely in Europe. Tell me, when we take uh, France here with uh, our 13 colonies, because I don't want to talk about country. The 13 colonies that that are using France ever, are they able to exchange with another country without the permission of the French country? We are not free. We are talking about our independence and creating of currency, our own currency. They are joking again. See that man. That black man, he is the, he is the man, the one who created all the disturbances and the nonsenses in Africa. The man of Chad, Mahmat, he is the only man who created all these other things. By the grace of God, our African economies, they are careful and they will be following this situation for that to change it. It is a shame for Africa once again. Our president passed away. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sidi, for your uh, contribution. Eh? Thank you so much. Uh, let, let's continue with uh, the analysis, eh? uh, Mr. Elijah Enoku. Uh, we are focused on, on the continental free trade area, and of course, questions will be always be like, what will Africa uh, trade with, and of course, the, the goods and everything. But then, uh, we, we also know that this is an opportunity uh, for Africa to position itself when it comes to international trade so how can we leverage this uh, uh, the uh, continental free trade uh, uh, area to position mm -hmm. Africa at the international uh, level of course with a uh, much uh, higher uh, competition that can be useful uh, in uh, to, to fast tracking or in fast tracking the full uh, implementation of uh, the uh, uh, continental free trade area uh, Clarice, before I answer your question, I think one of the things that we, we do on this uh, forum is to educate ourselves and educate our African population. The caller that just uh, asked, uh, was on the air there asked a very important question, which I think we need to clarify. He asked, what do we produce as Africans? What are we going to be trading among ourselves? That was one of his questions. And I think we need to clarify that because if we do not know what we possess and we do not know what our potentials are, we keep thinking as Africans that we do not produce much. No, we produce so much that the world needs. The cell phone that that young man or that gentleman used to speak to you on the studio there, close to 65% of everything that in that cell phone comes from Africa. And more than 95% of those minerals are processed up out of Africa. They only dig it out of Africa, process it somewhere else, produce those cell phones, and dump it back on Africa. So Africa should understand that we produce a lot, but it's not being processed on our soil. So I just wanted to be clear that you know when people ask questions like that, we 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 understand we we clarify them that yes, we have a lot that we can produce in Africa. You have the meat. Just take oil and gas, for example, that's a lot of it being produced in Africa. But it will shock you, you know, that it's just recently that people like Dan Gute have taken upon themselves for the processing of those uh, um, uh, mineral resources in the south of Africa. But a lot of it is being processed somewhere and sold back to us. The 
take it from Africa, process somewhere, sell it back to us. Who benefits? It's not the African. Yeah, we simply become consumers. So whether you're talking about cocoa, Arabica, coffee, which are the main things that we know in Africa, there is much more than cocoa, Arabica, coffee, and cotton. Again, as I said, more than 90% of the minerals that are being used in the world to produce whatever you might call comes from Africa, but they are not processed in Africa. Africa needs to you know, be in a position where they are only sending out semi-finished products. There is no reason why we cannot semi-finish the processing of nickel, bauxite, aluminum, iron, oil, oil and gas. There's no reason why we cannot process it in Africa. There is technology in South Africa and Egypt that we can process that. We can import that technology into Congo, Cameroon, Nigeria. There's technology that we can semi-finish uh, fin uh, semi our processing of nickel, cobalt, and all these other things in some other African country. So when there is this free trade happening within the African soil, we can import technology from somewhere else and process it within the African soil before we sell it. We do not have the need for them. We are going to sell it, but we need to process it on the African soil. So ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot that can be traded between Africans. So just wanted to clarify that question he asked. What are we going to be trading among ourselves? There is a lot that we can trade among ourselves. Now, coming back to your question, Clarice, how can the African continent take advantage of this African free trade zone? We talked about monetary policy. I want to just hint a little bit about that. We have the African Development Bank, but we do not have an African Central Bank. It doesn't exist. The central bank is the one that makes monetary policies. African Development Bank is just like any other bank. It gives loans to African countries, but it does not make monetary policies for African countries because it is not an African central bank. We don't have one. When you leave from Nigeria to Cameroon, you're jumping from Naira to CFA. You jump from Cameroon to the other West African uh, uh, region. You're jumping from uh, the CFA to East African or, I mean, West African CFA. You jump from there to Ghana, you're going from that CFA to Ghanaian shilling. You leave from Ghana and jump to Kenya, you're jumping to Kenyan shilling. From there, you leave from Kenya, you're jumping to Africa, uh, South African lira or whatever, Ryan or whatever they call. It's all jumbled all over the place. There is no coordinated, coordinated monetary policy that's going to help the African free trade zone benefit from the implementation of any regulatory framework that is going to benefit. Number two, let's talk about tariffs. When you impose tariffs on a product, that's to say, you're saying, give an example, rice that is being imported from China. We're going to say, any rice that's coming from China, we're going to impose tariffs on it in such a way that before it enters the African free trade zone, that tariff is going to increase the price of rice so much that it will not be competitive within the African soil. And therefore, the locally produced rice will have a competitive advantage and everybody will go for that locally produced rice. But right now, we cannot make such because that is a basic commodity that is being sold all over the African free trade zone. Everybody has its own tariff policy. Cameroon will impose this. Nigeria will impose this, this one will do this. There is no coordinated effort. And we cannot do that because there is no single regulatory framework in place to take care of that. Number two, I mean, number three, you asked about what are the benefits? What is it going to benefit us? When we have that free trade zone, for example, you are going to have not just free movement of goods and services, you are also going to have free movement of people Paul, we had this discussion on this program some time ago where it was easier for somebody to get a visa, a businessman to get a visa to go and do his business in Europe from Nigeria than it was for him to get a visa to go to his neighboring Ivory Coast from Nigeria. He had struggled for long to get a visa from Nigeria to go to Ivory Coast to go and do business. But it was easy for him to travel to Europe. The Europeans make it that easier because they'll be 
free trade of services, free trade of people, and free trade of businesses. This man cannot run a business in Ivory Coast because he cannot manage it. But he can easily run a business in Europe. And the resources that he's in, you know, investing in Europe, it is not Africans that are going to benefit from it. He's going to employ people in Europe. The currency exchange will be in Euro. The investment will be in Euro. The taxes is going to pay, it's going to pay to a European economy. The local government, the municipal government that he's paying rent is going to pay property taxes to that municipal government. All the benefits that are going to accrue from that business, nothing will come to the African, but it's being invested by an African man. Yes, it brings some little change in terms of profit, back home, and so on. But the colossal down profit of that business does not go to Africans, it goes to Europeans or whichever country it is. So free movement of people is going to, uh, is going to follow. Yes, we do understand the challenges that some countries are resisting because, you know, as I said before, a country that is politically stable will not just want to open its borders to a country that is politically unstable because they are afraid of war and arms and all that. So again, it is also going to push those leaders that have not put their house in order because there's going to be a preamble that says you must be able to put A, B, C, D in order before you become qualified to join this free trade zone. So it's going to push the African leaders to make sure that they put their house in order so that they qualify to be part of that free trade zone. And so on and so on and so forth. So the benefit of this is corrosion. If we even talk about the monetary policy itself, that is, it will take us 10 programs to even evaluate that because just the pecking of your own currency to another currency means that any fluctuation in that currency to which your own currency is pegged is going to affect your own currency. If you take the first CAA, for example, that is pegged to the euro, and before then, it was pegged to the French franc. Any gains, because currency do fluctuate, any gains that comes from an amelioration in the economy of those countries is not being found or is not being gained by those countries. It goes into the economy of France or those countries that are benefiting from the euro, but currently it is being benefited, uh, France is the one benefiting. Number four, every country and currency is pegged to the reserves of that country. So your currency is pegged to the gold reserve. As we speak, a lot of countries in Europe do not produce gold. But if you look at the tent from one to ten of countries that have the highest gold reserve in their central bank, pegged to their currencies. There are countries in Europe, and then, and then we have Canada. Of course, Canada is justified. Canada produces a lot of gold. The United States does produce gold. But the rest of the other countries, France inclusive, has no gold reserve, but they come among the first 10. How is it possible that a country that does not have any gold reserve is ranked 1 to 10, and their currency is being paid to that gold reserve, and is way up here, and the countries, African countries, that have those gold mines and those gold deposits are way, 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 way down the line. That tells you that the implementation of a free trade zone and free trade agreement within African countries, that will culminate, it will culminate in a single monetary policy with an African central bank. Again, I say African central bank because African Development Bank is not a central bank. It does not make monetary policy because there's no single monetary policy for Africa. When we have a single African currency being controlled by an African central bank, that would be the independence of Africa. Right now, we might call it political independence. As long as you do not have economic independence, we are still independent as African countries. Makes everything very problematic, eh? uh, Mr. Elijah Enwako, uh, the game changer for Africa, the inter uh, the continental free trade area, the impediment are there. We know what is actually uh, uh, slowing down the the full implementation or operationalization of this uh, uh, project, uh, performance. But then, what is it difficult? Why is it difficult to do? 
solve these uh, problems. Can we say uh, it is uh, due to lack of political will? And if yes, what level of political will do we need or, or from our leaders to see that they put an end to some of these uh, obstacles uh, uh, of the, the, the implementation of the free trade area to see that, of course, it moves from just uh, talking about the advantages, but then let us see how we are f actually trading uh, across Africa and, of course, benefiting from all of these uh, opportunities. Uh, to start, I think uh, when we say that uh, uh, when we are looking at uh, that uh, uh, financial independence and then talking about political independence, many Africans who ask, are we even politically independent? <laughs> because at times we really have to assess the uh, level of political independence, independence coupled with the fact that when you see a country like uh, Nigeria, if uh, you see major political or ma major uh, leaders of major political party campaigning for the presidency of Nigeria must go to Chatham House to do a presentation and uh, you in other French African countries uh, when the media meets you they want to know your stand with France which just says that even in politics there is still uh, maybe we have uh, African leaders have an, uh, their umbilical cord is tied yeah. to their former colonial masters so you see that there is a problem. There is a problem when we talk about that political, political independence, financial independence, and generally the independence of the African uh, uh, continent. The first thing I think that Africa needs to see, or we need to have a perfect understanding of it, is mental and psychological independence. We have to possess that, men that mentality of an independent people and uh, of a people not have a belief that uh, we are destined to solve our problems. I believe in a home, what makes, in an African home of course, what makes us see uh, a, a man as the head of the family is because we know that when there is a, an armed robber or maybe a problem, a challenge rise up in a home, even if the woman or the children are running to hide, what happens is that the man, even if the man is a weakling, the man will stand to face the challenge. Even if that's the last thing the man will do before exceeding the stage so africans need to carry that mentality on having an understanding that yes irrespective of whatever the thing that might have happened in the past it is our responsibility to face the future it is our responsibility to to to, to, to handle our own uh, problems then if we can have that mentality understanding that we first of all have to have that mental develop uh, mental independence before we start uh, trying to assess our political independence then we will understand that even with our mental independence there will be no need for us to seek authorization for somebody or maybe to seek approval from a particular country for us to take monetary policies or take political decisions or take decisions that will concern our local businesses who understand that with or without the people we are surviving we, uh, we have to survive we have to move ahead i really think that uh, we uh, basically at the local level we practice a lot of independence because uh, in africa you will see situations whereby if you go to the hospital if you carry your son to the, your son or daughter to the hospital and you notice that the doctor is not on seat even if it means you should resolve to help her means to see how you can guarantee the health of your child you have to do that those are some of the kind of drastic measures uh, we in Africa have to take and our leaders have to be people that carry on such mentalities to understand that there are some drastic decisions that they have to take even if those decisions are actually the last decisions they are supposed to take as leaders or even if they are the last things they will do in power they should understand that as far as it is for the growth or it is to secure the growth and the advancement of the african continent they should be ready to do it that is the kind of leadership mentality we have to have in africa before we can actually even boast of political independence financial independence and maybe the maybe uh, developmental independence if we don't actually actually look at it from that particular point in uh, po point we will understand that as time goes on we'll be moving around the loop 
it's like we, we have been uh, with our pecos around a particular cycle we keep on moving round and round there is no advancement there is no development we keep on blaming or hoping thinking that this will happen or this has to happen time comes and go nothing is happening we are not seeing results and it is actually very difficult for us to see results because when the west came uh, to Africa, when they sat in the Berlin West African country the uh, con uh, conference, yeah. that was where they, they nursed the seed of the division, where they were like, okay, they have to be a, the principle of effective notification, effective occupation, you have to occupy Africa like this, no, we have to partition them like this, when we partition them, we give them different perspective, different views of how things are supposed to be done, and we have to end up schooling them on how they are to lead their people, and that, that seed that was sown so many years back, even after independence, it is still manifesting. So now it is left for us as a people who are educated, a people that are enlightened to understand that we have to independently free our mind to first of all gain that conscious that moral consciousness that we are a people we are a unique people with a unique identity that we can develop our unique policies our unique principles our unique guidelines a set up unique institutions that can position us on the global stage if not so we shall only be used as a dumping ground because whenever we sit down and we craft out something that is aimed at uh, uh, developing or advancing us, we will always sit down and then we are pointing those loopholes that can make such an initiative not successful. It has never been the problem of Africa to develop wonderful initiatives, but it has always been the problem of Africa how to overcome the loopholes mm -hmm. that are being yes. created on those initiatives, which I think that if we have to move ahead, the first thing that Africa has to see is how we can regularize the uh, mode of transportation or maybe to, uh, then we, we harmonize our customs, uh, duties, and so on and so on forth things that can facilitate basic uh, transactions between us in Africa transportation customs and so on and so forth as soon as we do that then we can start implementing it from there then we now move into the level of institutions in, because obviously if to say that we are ob we are objective and we know that the purpose of the African in the continental free trade area was to benefit us the moment we see that we have started the transaction and the benefits are not actually being realized then we sit down to have to see why we are not benefiting and then we know why we, we, we have to how we can move ahead what we need to set up the institutions we have to set up we have pointed out who is pulling us down what is pulling us down and how we have to resolve it and then at that time now when we are sitting on the table we are hitting the nail where we know that it failed to enter before uh, which is very imperative for um, uh, Jerrans. Uh, uh, it's uh, time for uh, for stakeholders, of course, for African uh, leaders to start implementing. Because uh, some pundits feel like we know the 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 challenges that the continent face, but then. Uh, Putting an end to these challenges is what uh, is actually uh, very pro problematic across Africa. Uh, as we continue, we see uh, Mr. Elijah Enoko. Uh, we highlighted some of the, the setbacks uh, of the, the uh, continental free trade area. And we know that for Africa to trade with itself, there is needs to uh, of compromise at a particular level. So, in your own perspective, uh, and uh, uh, what do you advise the the uh, after uh, secretary uh, to consider as far as uh, what needs to be compromised uh, uh, among African countries that have actually signed and ratified the the, the after uh, uh, his uh, deal to ensure that they are not held behind. Uh, every day we talk about the problems. How can we be in intentional about its operationalization uh, given uh, the, the fact that some people were always like trading together we are going to maybe uh, 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 forget our so sovereignty because we we know of uh, the, the border uh, issues that we need to tackle and whatsoever so how can we actually be more practical and more intentional about this uh, uh, trade deal and what can the after Secretariat uh, to as far as compromise is concerned among African states. Yeah, Rich, I, I, let me say this. African leaders need to take the bull by the horn. I'm telling you the truth. African leaders need to take the bull by the horns. 
it is not going to be given to them on a platter of gold. It is going to be, let me just give you some example. Recently, we saw the South Sudan president put an injunction and said, all local, all government uh, 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 transactions should be done in the local currency. That's the Southern Sudan pound because they came out with their own local currency. They stop all transaction with all international administration except you trade in their currency. And what happened? This currency had to negotiate. They had to come to the table. But if you keep playing hanky panky game with the Western uh, organizations and so on, you are going to remain where you are. Recently, we saw Mali and Burkina Faso talking about a confederation. They even talk about a federation, and that federation, they said they were going to create a trade zone, and that trade zone was also going to involve military alliances to fight the jihadists. We saw a lot of countries, you know, agitating around it. We saw France agitating. We saw some other countries agitating and say, why do they want to do this? What's their business in that? Their business is that their own interests are threatened. Number one, two, give the local companies the capacity to trade with other African countries and see the outcome of it. Some of these things are very practical. If you have local com companies that are competing, with international companies and those international companies already have a competitive advantage how do you expect your local industries to strive they're not going to strive but within an african free trade zone where those tariffs are put in place and you're only trading with your own african partners because you know just to educate ourselves and the public one of the lines of the items of that free trade zone is that the goods that are being traded or being given priority to trade tariffs free within the African zone have to emanate from Africa. You're not going to bring something from Europe or bring something from uh, uh, North America into the economy and then you expect it to be treated as a tariff free good. No, that one will still be taxed. When you do that, for example, you give the local products or local industries and firms that competitive advantage. Try that within your local communities and within other countries around Africa and see the advantage that that is going to accrue to your economy. Number two, you ask the question about some countries being afraid that, okay, if we go into this free trade zone, it's going to open the borders. The African continental free trade area is not a fusion of economies into one economy. No, it's not a fusion of you know, Nigeria economy being fused with the uh, Kenyan economy and Kenyan economy fused with the Ethiopian economy. It's not a fusion. No, it is a conglomerate where you have agreements between these countries for goods to flow from one to the other without those tariffs that are currently in place, giving them a competitive advantage over goods that are produced elsewhere, which means when it's a competitive advantage, what I mean is, if you bring a box of, you know, I don't want to ridiculously call it a box of mash. You can imagine that such a thing being produced elsewhere. If you bring a, a bag of rice, as I said before, from China, Chinese rice, before that bag of rice is sold in that free trade zone, it's going to be considered as a foreign good. And then tax, tax at a rate where it will be more advantageous for people to buy the locally produced rice than to buy Chinese rice. When that happens, it means Cameroon that produces rice will be able to sell cheap rice to Nigeria and the Niger Cameroonian economy is going to benefit from there. Nigerian economy is going to benefit from there because the person that would have spent 20,000 francs to buy a bag of Chinese rice will now spend 5,000 francs to buy a bag of Cameroon rice, and the 15,000 francs is going to go into another economic activity he or she was engaging in. It's as simple as that. These things need to be explained in simple terms so that our people understand, the government understand that it is better to trade with our own brothers because we produce these goods locally, and the advantage of us having these, our goods, have a competitive advantage of our foreign goods is going to be colossal. We are not opening our economy or opening the borders for all the people from one country to move into other. It is going to be big 
places and goods and services. That is what it's all about. Number three, I already mentioned before that, before you come into this free trade zone, you need to put your house in order. Imagine what is happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where you have about seven countries involved in war. Let's say that these seven countries have signed this free trade agreement and condition is given to them. So before you actually implement this, before you actually ratify this rather, you have to make sure that this war that is pouring into the country, we don't have rebels that are selling gold, bauxite, aluminum, whatever it is, to foreign countries producing arms, sending it back to the country, we buy it and we're killing ourselves. Before you ratify this, we have to see that all that is eliminated. That is also going to help politically to stabilize that part of the country and that part of the world. Because there are more than seven countries involved in that conflict. If they ratify this, a condition is given to them that this thing needs to be put in order. It's also going to help those countries stabilize politically. Now you go to the, econ I mean, uh, the educational sector of it. We talk about technology. If you have Nigeria that has a technology that produces, I don't know, cars or whatever it is, and then you have the Cameroonian economy that does not yet benefit from that technology. And due to the value chain that we are talking about, Nigeria is able to produce a part of a particular product in Cameroon. Then it will prefer to sell that technology to Cameroon and produce that good cheap in Cameroon and then export to the rest of African countries. And the benefit of it is going to accrue to both Cameroonian economy and Nigerian economy and the technology and the education is going to accrue to Cameroonians and Nigeria. And like, so the benefits are enormous to African countries. Whether you're talking about education, technology, we don't even want to go to the era of culture because it's a lot of benefit. With, again, I said, with the exclusion of those other foreign countries that are exporting their own into the country. Chinese dog is happening in Africa a lot. Western dog is happening in Africa a lot. Arab dog is happening in Africa a lot. All these we excluded. We deal with African goods produced by African economies, consumed by African people, and only when we are not able to produce that particular good that we now say, okay, we do not have this, we don't have this technique, we are going to import this one. It is going to be colossal. We are going to continue, uh, Mr. Kufum. Uh, Mr. Elijah, while, uh, while talking, mentioned about, uh, uh, I also uh, always call it external uh, factors. And uh, then uh, let's let's look at the, the role of uh, the external actors and how uh, they are helping to actually stifle uh, this, uh, uh, the full implementation or operationalization of the African continental free trade area. You bear with me that the past years have been very, uh, very uh, restive or problematic for the continent Africa rising insecurity we have coup d'etats uh, that characterize some countries especially in West Africa and uh, you can name the, re the rest how have these of course uh, helped to stifle the, 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 the fast implementation of the, the free trade area and of course how can we uh, put an end uh, to the uh, infringement from this uh, external actors that actually not helping the continent Africa uh, to to continue to write a good economic trajectory uh, for us sir uh, absolutely when we are looking at those those factors uh, there are things that africa has been running away from over to, for close to about 60 years that are just coming to fruition that are just coming into manifestation now and uh, when we, we when we are talking about AFCTA and then we are talking about those particular factors like uh, political instability, scoop the tasks and uh, so on, uh, insecurity, then we, we have to also understand that it is a responsibility of our leaders, so those that we have entrusted public offices to, to, to know that apart from uh, uh, their self-aggrandizement, their self-protection and then enjoying what, uh, enjoying the the public offices that are put at their disposal, it is their basic responsibility to guarantee.
authority to guarantee stability and to work for the interests of the people. And the reason that you see all agitations popping up from different angles of Africa is simple. It's simply because those that we give public office to come into office just with one thing in mind, their self-interest and the interests of their family. When somebody is taking position today in Africa, one of the major things the person thinks about is what do I do to conserve power around me and to ensure that even when I'm not more in power, I should still be in control of power. Which absolutely that is not leadership. If Africa wants to go by that type of leadership, then we should know that the possibility of development is far-fetched from Africa. But now, when you take public office, when you treat public office as an office of the people, as an office that belongs to us today and cannot be with us tomorrow, and we render our own best we can for the people, then we will see that self-agitation uh, will calm down because if uh, the people actually entrust power into your hands and then they know that even if you mess up to Day, within the next two, three days, two, well, one year, two years, you give room for another person. They can be a little bit calm, and you see that they will be like, okay, let's uh, let's not overlook what he's doing because we know that in the future, or maybe in a, a year from now, two years from now, another person is coming in for us to try the person to see if the person will move us towards uh, the point we are hoping to to be there. But now, if we enter power, or if African leaders don't change that mentality of uh, trying to conserve power within themselves and then to still be in control of power when they are not in power then you always see such ag agitations and once the agitations are coming up it will be very difficult for policies to actually be, be 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 implemented in Africa because whenever you you maybe leave power and then you are still controlling power by a, through the mechanism you have created, you will notice that whenever there is a, a policy like this one, the person you have put in power will not actually give full consent. The person will have to run back to you to find out from you what do you think about this because the person is there just as a figurehead and uh, once somebody is a figurehead in the position of leadership, what is the person looking for? The person is looking for the possibility to feed himself and also ensure that by the time he is not more there in power, neither him nor his family should go through problems. So the first thing that Africa needs to adopt is effective leadership. When, you, when I talk about effective leadership, the kind of leadership that is people-centered, not self-centered, the kind of leadership that has just one objective and that objective is for the people of Africa. That objective is to advance the vision of uh, the African continent. Continent. We have watched a political scenes in Africa whereby people are clamoring to be leaders of countries, giant, gigantic nations across Africa, and the only thing that is giving them that audacity to think that they can be leaders is because they believe that it is their own turn to be leaders. Those are not the kind of people that Africa needs, or so those are absolutely not the kind of leaders that are needed in Africa, the African continent if we must advance the, the development of Africa. If to say that Africa must go ahead, when it comes to the, the, the domain of education, when we see that we are, prop, we, we, we are facing educational crisis, the person we are bringing in should be educational focused and know that as I'm coming in, these are the policies I'm bringing on the table, these are the policies that will be implemented. And even if to say that these policies are in implemented right up to this level before I leave power, then my, uh, the person coming after me should be able to continue without totally erasing or bringing up new policies because Africa. there is no, no, no there is no trajectory of continuity in Africa. You lead today, tomorrow when you are giving power, another person is coming up with a new modus operandi, a new mode of operation that is different from yours, then you notice that maybe the number of years you have spent in power were wasted or or maybe the, uh, the, the, the public funds you use, they were wasted. You even see people who come, they will go to the level of destroying even infrastructure to start everything from the basis. Then another person comes in the future to start again all over. Then years goes by, we see that we are just going around the same spot, which is the biggest problem Africa is, uh, is going through. So African leaders should bear in mind that there should be that possibility of continuity. 
if you lead today and you are handling over to me tomorrow, then I should know that I'm continuing from your shoes. Maybe I should strengthen what was not straight under you. Then I hand over to somebody who in turn tried to, uh, to strengthen where I was weak and then build, and build other stronger ties, hand over to another person. Then with that now we'll understand, we'll be able to, uh, to, to, to judge or maybe to, to evaluate the, 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 the advancement of the, uh, the, the continent. Anything short of that, we'll notice that today we'll talk about the African continent of free trade area. Maybe the, this set of leaders, when they are not more in, uh, in leadership, another set will come up and then they will coin another, uh, wo another phrase, then give it another name, maybe with same objective, then try to play around with it. Then by the time they are not more in power, another set comes up, coin another one, and time goes on. The masses are suffering. The continent is regressing. We, we the, the, the Europeans are, are, are feeding fire on us. We are not advancing. We, are, we cannot appreciate our own resources. We cannot appreciate the things we are producing. We cannot even enjoy what we are producing. We keep on witnessing capital flight. We keep on witnessing uh, uh, all sorts of ills in the society. Meanwhile, we have everything it takes. We have the human resources, we have the natural, the resources, natural resources, we have the financial resources, but we are just being manipulated. We have to put an end to those systems. And then we start reflecting as a people. We start moving towards our own advancement. Let those we give offices to at least prove us wrong or maybe prove us that, yeah, we, we, they are worthy of the position we have given to them. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Thong Jurans, like you've underlined, uh, we need a leadership uh, that will promote accountability, transparency, and, uh, and of course, the type of politics uh, that is practiced across Africa also has a lot to do uh, with why we, we, we can't see the full implementation of uh, the uh, uh, of the African continental free trade area. Uh, of course, uh, there it is the moment to transform Africa with knowledge, and I think with the right mindset, those at the helm and other stakeholders, we actually drive this uh, single trade zone uh, to its full implementation, given the opportunities uh, that it presents to both uh, uh, the African continent and its people. Uh, coming to you, uh, Mr. Elijah, let's look on, uh, uh, on this very particular aspect, which is very important. We're talking about the capital, the human resource. We know the continent is actually a young continent we have vibrant young people across Africa so how what do you think can be done to galvanize these young people on the, the, the uh, continental free trade area because I think if the young people of Africa are educated, uh, if uh, well educated eh, about uh, uh, the dictates of the African free trade area, they will go a long way to ensure its sustainability. Because when we talk about free trade, it's for it to start and we see it being uh, sustainable. So how can this uh, human capital be harnessed to bring forth the potentials of young people to <laughs> ensure that they are also inculcated in uh, this uh, very uh, important, uh, you, you, you called it a crucial uh, project for the continent, Africa. Clarice, uh, let me answer your question in two dimensions. The first dimension is what I would call internet, uh, intellectual property rights. And I will give very specific examples so that people understand what I'm talking about. A country like China, when they are coming to Africa to implement any project in Africa, they will come with every single thing that is needed for that project from China. I'm serious. They will come with spoons. They'll come with knives. They'll come with mattresses. They will come with beds. Nothing is purchased from Africa. That's what I'm talking about. There is, I just give those basic ones to tell you that if they cannot transfer simple items like spoons and knives and so on, they are not ready to transfer the intellectual property. Right now, as we speak in the times of Trump, one of the things that Mr. Trump succeeded to do is to stop China from, you know, I don't know what term to use, stealing international property from the United States. In, Af in Africa, 
China does not share its intellectual property with African countries that they do business with. There is no transfer of Chinese technology on African soil. There is no transfer of, you know, the kind of education, what they do to get to where they are on African soil. But there is only implementation of Chinese projects on the African soil. China is almost overtaking the rest of Europe in terms of projects on African soil, but their technology does not remain in Africa. So Africa needs to work on that one to make sure that there is whoever they deals with, there is transfer of knowledge and technology from that part of the world into the African uh, uh, educational system and curriculum. Number two, Africans have been made to believe, for some reason, I don't know where this came from, to believe that they cannot survive by themselves. The economies and the monetary policies that are pet on Western economies, they have been told that if they stand by themselves, the economy will be so unstable, unreliable, so much that they have to depend or peg their currency to some Western currency. That is a lie. I will give you an example about how Africans have been made to believe that they are not able to stand by themselves or produce their own resources and make their own economy sustainable. Recently, we saw what happened in Uganda, that a foreign company came to Uganda, evaluated the gold results of Uganda. It was worth $13 trillion. And those people with whom they did the evaluation were told that the Ugandan economy was going to get something less than $1 billion from that transaction. Imagine a gold reserve that is going to be worth $13 trillion. The economy is only going to get less than $1 billion from it. And they were ready to sign that until so much that the government, I mean, uh, the president, uh, you worry, Yusufini, who is not you know, my favorite, but I have to give him credit for that, step in and say, what am I looking at here? I'm not an economist. I'm not a, an engineer. I'm not a technician. But this doesn't make sense that we have a reserve that is worth $13 trillion, and we're only able to benefit less than a trillion from it. It doesn't make sense. And that when he stopped it. Why am I giving this example? We have been made to believe that we are not sustainable we cannot sustain our own economy. We cannot do it by ourselves because they have withheld the technology from us. That is what is happening. They have withheld their technology and therefore we, are, we do not have access to that technology. And there is no transfer of that technology to the African soil. Therefore, this free trade agreement will benefit transfer of technology and resources within the African free trade zone such a way that if the technology is happening in Ghana, Cameroon and Nigeria should be able to benefit from it. If foreign direct investment is coming to Ghana and the Ghanaian economy is benefiting from that transfer of technology, the young people, the universities, the intellectuals, the, the engineers, the economies, if they benefit from it, they will be able to transfer that technology within the African zone and all African countries are going to benefit from it and so on and so forth. So the young African population and the human resource is a boost, is a, 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 a powerhouse that the West is not able to contend with. But the only way that they keep us where we are is what I already said. They make us to believe that we are not self-sufficient and we are not sustainable without them. Because, again, they withhold this technology from us and we are not able to transfer that technology to our universities. You know, we go on into, you know, degrees that at the end of the day, you have thousands of people, PhD and masters, and, and they're loitering in the streets and they are not able to do anything. Because, again, these people are hoarding intellectual property from us, but they are trading with us. What the free trade zone will do is that they will negotiate and make sure that if you are going to trade with us as international partners, you're not just trading goods and services, you are trading that intellectual property with us and transfer of technology with us so that we can be self-sufficient by ourselves. 
in data, Africa should be intentional about uh, uh, everything while negotiating, of course, uh, the trade deals with external uh, partners. Uh, uh, you know, we cannot uh, trade in isolation. There is need for international trade in order to, to gain uh, exchange of, of expertise. As, as you already mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Elijah Inwaku, uh, now, uh, uh, Pufong Jorans, let's continue with this. Uh, do you think, yeah, the, the free trade era is already there, but then uh, do you think there are already existing laws that will come to, to penalize, uh, especially member states who do not uh, work uh, according to the dictates or the guidelines uh, outlined by the uh, AFTA Secretariat? And how do you think, do you think this can also go a long way to see that countries are intentional about seeing uh, the practicality of this uh, historic trade? Uh, I think as uh, Mr. Mr. Tayo earlier stated, the various ministers of trade of uh, those different countries, they, they are trying to work on uh, a framework that uh, is supposed to harness or bring out the sanctions and uh, what is we expect and or what can facilitate the, the easy uh, trading within uh, um, countries that have ratified uh, uh, this uh, uh, AFCT uh, agreement. So normally I think that um, what we are more concerned about now shouldn't really be the sanctions but now the the ease at uh, which it can be done because if uh, we are still battling with the ease then going to the sanctions will be like we are asking for for more but uh, so much i think that uh, we know that uh, some of the objectives the general objectives is just to maybe create a continental custom block which of course will harmonize the custom policies within the the the, the continent and uh, it will be directly beneficial to the uh, to the to the AFCT act because it will maybe facilitate or the, it will, it will ease the the movement of goods and uh, if we can add one thing, of course, transportation of uh, pers personnel, which will boost uh, uh, human resource uh, uh, import imports and exports in such a way that uh, we can maybe export import technology as um, Mr. Elijah has rightly stated, then it will actually help us so much. Then we can only think of sanctions now when we see that those particular aspects have been put in place and some con some some uh, some countries have failed to respect them. Like uh, maybe we know that in the preamble, the states that some blocks or maybe blocks uh, different blocks in the African continent are supposed to facilitate them. And we have witnessed situations whereby some people who make statesmen of maybe having the uh, ECOWAS passport and we're supposed to pay stamp duties so to stamp visas to move into ECOWAS country. We have also learned or oh, we, we heard Dan Guti uh, said on air one time that he was using the African Union passport and he had to uh, pay for a visa to enter another country. Those are the kind of uh, things. So those are the, the things that should be considered when we are looking into sanctions for those that will to default us because uh, we might set the principles or we might, we might set the ball rolling, but some countries, most of these countries are, are plagued by insecurity, instability, and they, they are looking for the slightest possibilities to raise funds. So they will still, and most of them raise funds through visa stamps and so on and so forth. So they might still think that, okay, that is a way for them to generate income into their national treasuries, which I think that uh, the, uh, as a country or as, as a respective ministers of trade that form the secretariat of the, uh, uh, forms the technical bench of the African continental trade, free trade area, as they are looking into it, they should see the sanctions that will be meted on countries that will maybe tax business people or maybe a request of visas before movement or maybe some kind of exorbitant transaction or import or custom duties on the people. If such sanctions are put in place, it will just enhance a perfect move as far as the trade area is concerned. So I believe that the technical bench is doing a lot to consider these. But now we can actually not see the impact because the number of countries that have actually ratified it and are trying to practice it. And I don't even think that there is actually a country that is practicing it to full scale because even those countries that are claiming to be practicing it are 
are just being selective. They are just taking the aspects of the preamble that satisfy them and then practicing it. So if to say that we, we, we say we are stepping up to maybe 50%, 60%, and 70%, there is a need for those uh, sanctions to be made known by those that have actually ratified the, the agreement in such a way that if uh, uh, there is any country that is defaulting, the country should actually be sanctioned and the sanction in a way that other countries will copy and will know that yes this has come to stay and this has come to enhance development indeed de development uh, is uh, uh, what uh, the continent uh, africa needs eh? uh, especially uh, economic uh, development uh, we we have uh, five more minutes to be together but in that state time for us to continue to analyze uh, this very important topic of the continental free trade area, its potential to drive economic development in Africa, to drive economic integration. And then we will look at this particular moment, how leaders can leverage on the continental free trade area to boost uh, export. So let's uh, answer this question, uh, Mr. Elijah Inwako, uh, to see that how can Africa leverage on the uh, African continental free trade area to boost export. And of course, another question that is linked to this one, we know that recently uh, there, there has been again a, a mad rush to the African continent. We saw the last time it was US-Africa summit, China-Africa summit. And uh, in the months ahead, we'll be seeing uh, the uh, Russian Federation meeting with African leaders. And uh, the, 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 the African Union Commission chairperson, Musa Faki Mahamad, some years ago uh, underlined us that Africa is already aware and is conversant that uh, there is a, a high level of multilateralism across the African continent and of course challenging all stakeholders across Africa to take this as an advantage to uh, chat or maybe negotiate uh, well when discussing with international partners and today we are talking about implementing the african free trade area we are talking about uh, our relationship with international uh, countries or uh, countries that have are well industrialized and well developed so how can we leverage on this international cooperation to bring of course uh, 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 practicality or to add some uh, impetus to the uh, uh, single market that is the african continent Free trade area. Absolutely, Clarice. Absolutely. Imagine, let me put this scenario. Imagine Nigeria making a trade agreement with the United States, Cameroon making its own trade agreement with France, Ethiopia making its own trade agreement with China. Look how disunited or what are the gains that are going to come from there. And then imagine these three countries come together, right? Yeah. They come together on the one platform, agree on common principle, and they are now making a trade agreement as a body with the same United States, with the same China, with the same France. Now, no more as even the, I mean, no more as separate countries, but as a single platform. That's a huge negotiating potential that they have right there. For sure, Africa is not going to isolate itself from the rest of the international community because they have created a free trade zone, but they are going to negotiate now as a single body. They say unity is power. Unity is power. Coming together to negotiate the same agreement that they would have done individually on single countries under one umbrella. Oh my goodness. Those countries are going to tremble when they are negotiating with Africa because they are negotiating with 50 five countries sitting on one table as one that's a gigantic negotiation potential and power that they are going to come to the table with then number two in terms of export they ask how can they leverage on this export okay i'm going to give an example there are things that nigeria produces and does well more than cameroon and there are things that kenya produces and does well more than nigeria and there are things that Cameroon produces well more than China, I mean, uh, more than Ghana. In this continental free trade zone, with barriers removed, the volume of trade between Cameroon and Nigeria is going to quadruple on that particular item that Nigeria, I mean, uh, Cameroon produces more, and they're going to sell more, if, and it's going to give a competitive advantage to Cameroon because the tariffs are going to be removed. 
it's going to give a comparative advantage to Nigeria that is going to be the consuming country because they are going to buy at a cheaper rate because the tariffs have been removed. It's going to be colossal to the rest. I'll just give this example to give a platform on how it's going to boost exports within the African community. Export within African country. We're not even talking about, you know, export out of the country. And then in terms of exports, I mean, out, out of the zone, in terms of export out of the zone now, those continents, I mean, those countries that were formerly trading with those individual countries now are now going to be trading with a block. The same example that I gave now going to benefit, it comes into play here because when you trade as a block, you're going to trade as, you know, the volume of trade now is going to be multiplied by those number of countries that are in that block. So when we now trade as a block, China is going to trade with African uh, free zone as a block. The United States is going to come in trading with them as a block and all the other countries. So it, the multiplier effect of having this free trade zone, it's going to be enormous, enormous on this African country. So again, before I run, I know we are running out of time. One thing I want to tell African countries, leave a legacy. Whether you're Paul B of Cameroon, you're Paul Kagame of Rwanda, you are Buhari of Nigeria, you are Tuadora of Biangemba of uh, uh, Guinea, Equatorial Guinea. Yeah. It did not take long for Thomas Sankara within five years to leave a legacy. It did not take long for Mogufuli to leave a legacy. Leave a legacy for your people to remember you. Do not toe the line of the Western powers that want to destroy this African free trade zone. Because I say this because we have seen this happen elsewhere, Clarice. We've seen the echo that was put into place by the African uh, West Af uh, ECOWAS. Mm -hmm. We saw one country manipulated by France destroy that plan. We would have had a single monetary policy in that zone. But today it's not existing. Please, African countries that are listening to us, Leave a legacy that you'll be remembered for good and not for evil. Thank you so much. Leaving a good legacy for the continent Africa is very imperative. It's primordial. And of course, it will write a, a new pattern of uh, leadership across the Africa. Uh, we are culminating a uh, uh, performance. So we want to have a concluding statement from you regarding uh, a topic for discussion this day. And of course, uh, other issues of that are affecting the African continent, which leads are now deliberating there in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, the first thing uh, I'll say to conclude is that we should have, uh, uh, as African leaders, uh, they should always possess this mind and understanding that the public office is meant to serve the interests of the people and not their personal interests. And uh, as regarding the African continental free trade area, I want us to understand as Africans that we all have uh, a part to play for the AFCT agreement to come into fruition and full realization. And we should never ask ourselves what we can produce or what we are supposed to export or import. We should know that in our own capacities, we can export the little we can, and we can as well import the little that we can to make sure that African produce products, uh, African goods and services are sold in an African market enjoyed by Africans and then the price determination should strictly be a responsibility of uh, Africans. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for that uh, uh, proof of uh, Javans. Uh, uh, one uh, concluding statement from you, Mr. Elijah uh, Enoku, uh, on uh, the uh, uh, African Continental Free Trade Area, the AU Summit. We know that after this day, uh, we'll see resolutions uh, that uh, the, uh, the leaders or various leaders have actually come up with in order to solve the, the problems of the continent Africa. And like we underlined earlier, 
idea. It's not uh, about uh, the resolution, but then how uh, uh, fast uh, or how ready and intentional are we to uh, implement uh, these uh, uh, resolutions arrived at after uh, high profile meetings like uh, this one that is occurring already uh, in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Yeah, I will advise them if they can take an advice from me <laughs> is um, to take the baby steps. What I mean by that is sometimes they always say that uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. Because we've talked about this African free trade zone for a long time now, and the baby steps have not been taken. Implement something. Start from somewhere. Let people start seeing realistic things on the ground. Just the legal framework, it doesn't take, it's not rocket science to come up with a legal framework, especially some, since some of the countries have similar, you know, um, institutional uh, background. What I mean by that is, you have, for example, the French African countries have almost the same systems. It's very easy to harmonize those. The Anglophone uh, African countries have almost the same system. It's very easy to harmonize that. Whether you are talking about Ohada or whatever it is that you're using, those systems are similar. It's very easy to harmonize the legal framework of tariffs and all whatnot. Put that simple baby step in place and let's start seeing what is happening. And then if there are obstacles in the way, you can be tackling them. But simply having a draft document every year you go and meet, a draft document every year you go and meet, nothing concrete on the ground. You're not giving hope to the people. That's why I said I am optimistic but I'm also pessimistic because if I don't see any concrete thing on the ground, any first step, you're not giving hope to the people that you're actually doing anything. So let them start with the baby step, implement something and act on it and obstacles along the way, like the war and those other countries that are having issues and floating of weapons, it can be tackled along the way. But simply having a document without any concrete action, you're not giving hope to the people. So again, start from somewhere, implement the baby steps, and then we'll go from there. I hope on that uh, optimistic note that we can get somewhere. Uh, defining or getting to the top. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Elijah Enoko, to reiterate that you are a researcher with uh, Leeds University on African Development. I thank you immensely for your time and, of course, for giving great insight on this very important topic. Thank you so much for having me, Clarice. Anytime, we can always talk about Africa, for sure. It's it's always a, a pleasure, and of course, we acknowledge uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Teniola uh, Tayo, who joined us, but couldn't uh, actually push to the end of the uh, uh, program for some uh, reasons uh, beyond control. Thank you for, for being there and for sacrificing to be with us. And to you, uh, Mr. Pufong Jovens, thank you for accepting to grace uh, this edition of the Pan-African Debate. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Indeed, it's always a pleasure to have uh, great uh, gentlemen and ladies share their views on issues affecting the African continent. And uh, we will continue to talk constructively till Africa attains the position uh, that it has to attain, uh, especially as far as uh, economic, uh, uh, its economic trajectory is concerned. Thank you for trusting the Pan-African Television. And I will beg to leave you now, but don't go away. Uh, give Keep having a lovely moment uh, as you follow programs on Africa Media TV. Bye-bye and have a splendid weekend.